Highway 1. I can see her pacing in the rearview mirror. Luna, my service dog, is becoming frantic. Has she been cooped up for so long? The need to, free, to be free is becoming more apparent. I slowly pull over to the side of the highway, stopping the car in front of the hi a highway sign. There, brazened in the forest green metal sign of reflective white paint, California Highway 1. The mountains on my right pushes all the way down to the ocean with a scar of the highway cutting, alongside the mount cutting along the mountainside. Above the highway, the hillside is heavily covered in redwoods, giving a thick canopy blocking out the sun as it sends in the morning sky. To my left, the rocky face of the mountain plummets down at a near 90 degree angle, crashing into the surf below. Highway 1. I stare at the forest green sign with the white reflective paint for quite a while. I eventually reach over, put the car in park, and turn off the ignition. My trance is broken by the whimpering in the back seat. She is desperate to stretch her legs and relieve herself. I open the driver's side, stepping onto the highway my boots crushing the gravel on the side of the road, grinding the small particles into almost dust as I walk to the rear of the vehicle. Highway 1. The convoy is traveling down the road at 30 kilometers an hour. It's in a relatively safe speed along what has been deemed as the highway of death, a main thoroughfare in Afghanistan that links the military outposts together. I've made this trek three dozen times in many different units. Today, I have the fortune to be the passenger with a team I have traveled with on many occasions. I'm always greeted with respect. I'm not completely sure if it's due to my rank. Since I am each convoy operation, I'm always the senior enlisted Marine. And nine out of 10 times, the officer has little to no experience in a combat zone. Could also be the fact that I'm a representative of the commanding general, going outside the wire to inspect any non-combat related accidents. Or what I like to think is that I know my place. I sit quietly in the truck and let the Marines do their job, since they know what they are doing. Once we get to the accident scene, however, the convoy Marines are there to provide security for me while I do my investigation, because I'm fucking good at my job. Yeah. Over the course of a few months, I'm ferried with, the, with them multiple times. I've become familiar with their personalities. The ones I know best are the Marines of Truck 3 and the convoy. It's my go-to vehicle. By now, the Marines know this. When they hear that I'm hitching a ride and makes, they make space for me, they greet me with, good to see you, Gunny, or ready when you are, Gunny. I typically murmur some kind of gruff comment like, what's so fucking good about it? Or, I was ready yesterday, where the fuck were you? <laughs> or my personal favorite, who fucking pulled your chain? The bander is a form of camaraderie. The tone is hard, yet a slight smile is on both sides. Corporal Smith always rides in the turret. From the conversations that I overhear from the Marines, Corporal Smith isn't particularly a very good shot. However, he's a terrible driver and an even worse navigator. <laughs> However, I do notice that Corporal Smith serves two real functions. One, that he is always the most talkative. He has jokes, stories, and rumors. Second, Corporal Smith always has food. But it goes. Stash any place that I can get stowed in, under seats, in cargo pockets, shoved between ammo cans, hell, even inside ammo cans. On a past convoy op, Corporal Smith asked me, hey, Gunny, I know you didn't get a chance to eat this morning. Um, you hungry? I gave him a sideways look and said, what do you got? He proceeded to pull two bologna sandwiches out from under, under a turret track that he had duct taped there at some point. I... I decline not knowing when they actually been duct taped there and that the fact that it was 104 degrees in Afghanistan. <laughs> Corporal Smith shrugged, took a bite, made a face, then threw, then threw the sandwich to a stray, a stray mangy mutt that had been running alongside the convoy. The stray didn't care about the taste or the smell. It was happy to get something to eat because it didn't know when it was going to be able to eat again. This particular convoy operation that I was on now I'm going to investigate a vehicle of rollover. The information I received assigned when assigned to the mission was no enemy contact, three American service members injured, two American service members dead, local casualties unknown. As we rolled along the, along the highway, <clears throat> I was in my typical spot in truck three watching the desert roll along in the foreground, passing burnt out discarded vehicles, 
Afghans walking along the road with fuel, fuel and water cans, running along the convoy, the Afghan mud, that has taken an affectionate name as Bob. Even though it is quite visibly a female due to its low-hanging tits from multiple litters. The mood in the truck was light and jovial. I overheard words of congratulations and laughter. Corporal Smith hands me two pieces of paper. There are blurry images printed from a printer that is noticeably low on ink. He is smiling from ear to ear. You know what that is? He asks. I instantly recognize the blurred image pictures as an ultrasound. But not wanting to alert, lose my hard demeanor, I reply, a Warshak test? The look of confusion on Corporal Smith's face it was immediate, either because he didn't think that I knew what a, a picture was, or he didn't know what a Warshak test was. When I saw the look of confusion on his face, I congratulated him and asked if he knew the gender. He said it was still too early to know, but he didn't care. With a big smile on his face, he reached under the turret gun and pulled out two bologna sandwiches and threw them to Bob, who was still keeping pace with the convoy. We arrived at the accident scene a little after 1 p.m. just south of the village that was barely populated and listed as a yellow zone, which means it's relatively safe, but always proceed as caution. I immediately surveyed the area, checked in with the young lieutenant, and gave him directions on how to deploy his Marines and the vehicles for the conductive recovery effort. He diligently echoed my instructions to the Marines as his own with a force that was actually surprising to me. The accident was straightforward enough. The vehicle was traveling way too fast, tried to navigate a, navigate a turn, causing it to roll over. I was left with a roughly drawn sketch of the accident scene, throwing me where, showing me where the dead and the wounded Marines had been prior to the evacuation. As I transposed the field sketch to my report, I noticed the extra body on the diagram left for me. My mission brief stated that there were three injured and two deceased. However, according to the field sketch, it listed three injured, three dead. I summoned Corporal Smith and another Marine to assist me and began to go to each location on the sketch, ensuring the accuracy of the report. The two Marines opened the back of the vehicle where the final body was displayed on the sketch. Inside was the remains of a British soldier. His body was bent in only a way a master contortionist could achieve. His chest was pressed firmly against the wall while the seat he was once resting in is now lodged into his back, allowing him to hover above the floor. The smell of rotting flesh overwhelmed the two Marines holding open the door. They both began to gag on the pungent smell. I quickly grabbed a brace, propped open the door, giving the reprieve to the two Marines. After Corporal Smith and his helper left the area, I grabbed my camera and began documenting the scene for posterity. Every angle that could be photographed I did, except for the inside. In an attempt to postpone the inevitable as long as possible, once I had procrastinated long enough, I steadied my nerves, took a deep breath, and stepped into the rear of the vehicle. Highway 1. She is now at the back of the car, fixated on me. The look of anticipation, on her for me, anticipation for me to release her from her confines is not fully ready to let her run free, so I give her a hand command to stay. Press the release button on the back of the hatch, watching her lay patiently for me to give her a command to exit. I'm about to give her the command as, semi tr as a semi-truck speeds by blaring its horn as it passes. I spin on my heels, with m viewing my surroundings, looking for any possible danger. A bit startled, I slowly sit on the back deck of the car. She quietly moves next to me, waiting by my side, understanding that it isn't the right time for her to take a break. I sit there, looking out across the Pacific Ocean, watching fishing boats in the distance, working their nets in the undulating sit waters. My eyes scour the turnout area. A multitude of cars and trucks are parked in all sorts of precarious positions. On the back of an old flatbed pickup, a young man is basking in the California sun. He lay near motionless except for the steady rise and fall of his chest, keeping almost time, perfect time with Luna's breath. Highway 1. As I pass through the threshold of the vehicle into the darkness of the troop area, the air is stagnant. The smell is powerful and pungent. Overwhelming, not only my nose, I can taste it on my tongue, I can feel it on my skin, crawling up my back, over my spine, seeping into my blood. My senses are overwhelmed, the primal desire to leave, shut the door, forget the whole thing grips me. 
I move deeper in photog photographing the scene as quickly as possible. I eventually make my way to the soldier. A pho I photograph every angle. His head is spun backwards, his eyes wide open, looking at me, asking, why? I look into his eyes one last time, take a quick photo without adjusting the focus, and exit the wreckage as fast as possible. When I step out into the heat of the day, I rip off my helmet, walk as fast as I possibly to possible to the convoy, kneel on the ground to the rear of the trucks, and dry heave. After the emptiness of my gut subsides, I reach into my ruck and grab a weathered pack of cigarettes. With shaky fingers, I remove one from the pack, place it between my lips, and light it desperately to inhale something else. I do my best to try to remain stoic and calm. With a slight nod of my head, I give to the lieutenant the permission to commence the recovery mission. As I sit chain smoking, observing the recovery, the lieutenant receives a radio request from the British military, asking that the remains be transported back to camp, since enemy action around the area has increased dramatically since the accident happened. The Marines from the convoy un under the lieutenant's watchful gaze remove the remains from the wreckage vehicle place him in the back of vehicle three. Corporal Smith walks up to me with a smile, hands me a Snickers bar, one from his many hiding places, and says, sorry, Gunny, they have to put him in your seat. Shrugging, the the sh shrugging his shoulders, he points to the British shoulder and walks away. Mid-stride, he looks over his shoulder and says, LT has made room for you in truck five. Shrugs again, points to the tow truck he is hooking up the, the wrecked vehicle up to. The, tr the return trip back is to base is long and slow. Nobody in the cab of the rec record truck says a word. I sit by the window, staring out into the desert beyond the convoy, further than the desert or the war. I stare beyond the ocean that divides me from everything I care about. I think of Corporal Smith and this child that will be born after he returns. I smile, thinking that he will be present at the birth, that he will be able to hold his child at the beginning stages of its life. I think about the British soldier riding in the seat I once occupied. I think about his family. I wonder if he had children. I think about my own family and look to the sky and wonder if they are thinking about me. The driver of truck five breaks the silence saying, there's that bitch. I look ahead of the convoy and see Bob a few hundred yards away pacing the side of the road. A slight smile curls on my lips imagining Corporal Smith digging out into as many troves of something to give the dog. As a truck as truck one begins to pass Bob, she jumps in the air, cowers briefly, and runs out into the desert. Truck four slams on its brake, turning abruptly to the left, causing truck five to do the same thing, to veer to the right instead. All subsequent trucks on the convoy do the same thing in a weird domino effect. Radio traffic is coming in cyclically as each truck reports their condition. Truck one, fuck, what the hell, what happened? Truck one, up. Truck two, shit. Truck two, do our damage, up. Truck three. Truck four, fuck. Truck four, truck three, fucking flip, fucking IED or something. All vehicles in the convoy report an up status in ascending order. Orders are given for the Marines to set the perimeter around the convoy. I immediately find the lieutenant on the radio requesting immediate air support. As helicopters cover us from the air, the Marines from protect the convoy and are on the ground in a 365 degree perimeter. The bomb technician that is aboard the convoy clears the road from any further IEDs. Once given the all clear, the lieutenant and I and a few non-commissioned officers walk up to the wreckage vehicle, wrecked vehicle, wrecked truck three. The chassis is nearly split in two. The remains of the British soldiers lie half in the center of the road and the other half, of the and the other half in the vehicle. The driver and co-driver are still wedged in the cab with the engine crushing them in place. Corporal Smith was still in his turret about 20 feet away, motionless with an empty smile on his face. His hands are laid prone against the ground with the bologna sandwich still resting in one hand and two folded pieces of paper in the other. In front of Corporal Smith is Bob nibbling on the, on the bologna sandwich and Corporal Smith's fingers. I lift my M4 from its resting position across the front of my body, raise the weapon to my shoulder, slide, side in and squeeze the trigger in two times in a rapid succession. The first round impacts her hind quarters immediately, causing her, to, her rear legs to go limp, dropping her tail to the ground. The second round strikes through her neck, exploding her esophagus. She falls limp to the ground with half a bologna sandwich in her mouth. Highway 1. I stare between two parked cars where a few dogs are frolicking with each other. Luna lays silently next to me with her head and nuzzle next to my leg, nudging my hand ever so often to elicit a pet perhaps an ear scratch, 
or at best a full-fledged hug. She doesn't persist. She knows that I'm not really present in mind as I am in body. The dogs I'm watching walk around, catch her gaze, and trot up to us. I notice her ears perk up, causing a break in my trance. I look down at her and see in her eyes the desire to play. But her need to sit with me to ensure that I'm okay takes precedence. I place my hand between her ears and scratch frantically. Her ears perk up further and her eyes brighten. She sits up, opens her mouth and smiles, letting her tongue fall out. I unhook her leash, rub her head one more time and say, it's okay girl, I'm here. Take a break, run free. Thank you. <laughs>